English. To you who like hearing something inspirational uh, about Buddhism. Many say, no matter how much Sawaki talks, his lectures don't inspire me in the least. Obviously, because I myself am not inspirational. The Buddha Dharma leads you to the place where nothing is special. They say, when I hear Sawaki talk, my faith falls down. Now I'm going to really put their faith on ice. This sort of faith is nothing but superstition. They say, Swaki's talks don't awaken faith in me. They don't awaken any superstition, that is all. There's nothing more funny than an old woman looking for inspiration. Everything for them is inspirational, even if it's only worth as much as pigeon shit. Anyway, this idea of inspiration is mistaken. Isn't it just personal inspiration they're talking about? They're only taking refuge in Buddha because they hope to get something out of it. Whatever sutra you read, it's always about devoting your body and life to the, to the way. Why is it that the whole world believes religion means praying to Buddha for good health and good business? However much good they do, everything that humans do is bad. If you give all day long, you think, I gave. If you do religious practice, you think, I practiced, I practiced. If you do something good, you never forget, I did good, I did good. Does this mean that we should do something bad instead? No. Even when we do good, it's bad. When we do something bad, it's even worse. Beware of doing good. A person who does good thinks they've done good. That's why they're worse than someone who has done something bad. Believe me, it's easier for those to do bad because they're humbled by it. Does that mean I should do something bad? You should even leave what is good alone. That is even more true for what is bad. If you do good, you start to work yourself up about everything bad. Um, you suddenly see in others. <clears throat> when you've done something bad, you're quiet because your own ass itches. People don't only calculate when it's a matter of money. In everything they do, they try to bargain up or down. That's because their body and mind haven't dropped off. Only when body and mind have dropped off does this business not count anymore. Dropping off body and mind means immeasurability, limitlessness. When somebody... When someone's made another clever comment, I say, your rice soup is letting off hot air. This means that with a, with a full stomach, it's easy to talk big. Fighting, sex, greed and lies. In other words, a human being. <clears throat> Everything thought by human beings of flesh and blood is mistaken. The willow is green. The blossoms are red. Buddhist teaching is self-evident. But people cover it up with unnecessary categories. Good, bad, useful, useless and so on. Rather than simply sitting zazen, people try to put a melody on top of it. That's why they are able to sing their Buddhist hymns and somehow feel pious doing it. It's easy to slip back into human happiness and unhappiness, love and hate, good and evil. Do good, leave the bad. There's no doubt about that. But is it so clear what's good and what's bad? Good and bad go hand in hand. Zazen is beyond good and evil. It's not moral education. Zazen takes place where communism and capitalism finish. If something like emptiness or nothingness existed, then it wouldn't be emptiness or nothingness. The expression seeing emptiness means that there isn't even an emptiness to see. As long as you don't get sick, you forget your body. Even I forgot my legs when they were still strong enough to walk and run. My legs only seem so important to me because they're so weak. Whoever is healthy functions without being conscious of their own health. It's the flaws that bother us. When no mental phenomena appear, there's nothing to worry about. Buddhism must teach the liberation that has nothing to do with contracts and words. It is that which only a Buddha <clears throat> and a Buddha can confide to each other. If both sides don't understand everything from the beginning, it will never be understood at all. Okay. So the things that I want to talk about um, from this chapter are why do you need inspirational words to learn how to live and what's the difference between good and bad um, when I was working as a journalist um, in the world of culture I basically quite quickly came to realize about the limitations of words and ideas um, <clears throat> like the people that I came into contact with and just the general sort of, you know, uh, language that you'd come across was full of buzzwords to describe 
you know, various things um, that were, say, cool or inspirational. And then when someone who was, you know, uncool, like your parents, uh, started using those words, these people would kind of cringe and then they'd come up with a new word to describe what they liked or they'd just sort of abandon that thing and move on to something else. Um, so after a while, I started to see just kind of how meaningless all these things were. Um, you know, sometimes I'd go to these like events or something and you just see these sort of crazy characters just like talking absolute rubbish and you just get this sort of weird feeling in your stomach just like, oh, just what the hell is going on here? Um, so yeah, you just sort of see the way people can react with ideas and words and it can be so superficial. And um, my boss at the magazine, he was kind of, uh, while being in this world at the same time, he was sort of, you know, hated this stuff. So he was sort of self-loathing, I guess, in a way. This is like classic sort of person who works for a magazine. They sort of, you know, they do something they like, but at the same time, they're sort of very sort of cynical and critical. Um, but he always told me to never use uh, adjectives with whatever I wrote. So he was like, you know, if you're going to be a good journalist, you can't rely on adjectives to describe something. So like, oh, this is, uh, I don't know, colourful, lively, exciting, whatever. Uh, he was like, that's just bad journalism. Because um, he, he wanted to escape these sort of buzzwords. Um, so for me, I was, when, he, when I first started writing, I would just sort of sit in front of my laptop and have a sort of existential crisis because I was just like, you know, what the hell do I write? I, I don't know how to write about anything. It's, you know, it's all kind of meaningless. Like all these words just seem meaningless to me now. So, I mean, this is why in this chapter there's this sort of emphasis from Kodo to say he doesn't care whether he's inspirational or not. Because I think most of the time when you attach yourself to words, you know, it just leads to illusion. Um, uh, as he also says, you know, Buddhism must teach liberation that has nothing to do with contracts and words. So I think in contrast to this uh, liberation that he's spelling out, um, you know, if you just rely on words, you, it's the complete opposite of liberation. You, you become trapped. Um, from my experience uh, in sort of Western Zen, I think this kind of thing happens a lot. I think, you know, there's nothing more awkward than hearing some sort of teacher in a sort of serene, soothing voice uh, repeating sort of translated words like uh, body mind or the present moment. And then they, they talk about some sort of wilting flower. I, I mean, for me, this kind of thing just gives me like the creeps, like it's, you know, like something from a horror movie. I think if you play some sort of sinister music with this person, like just a video of this person, it would sort of scare everyone away. Um, yeah, these sort of characters sometimes are just, uh, you know, they're, they're using these words, but it doesn't really, it doesn't feel genuine. Um, so I guess also this is why, you know, Kodo says in this chapter, he basically says, you know, the Buddha Dharma leads you to the place where nothing is special. I think, you know, a lot of the time, and especially when we first become interested in Zen or Buddhism, you're, you're looking for this kind of special person. And, um, you know, if someone has practiced for a long time and perhaps they're from a country that you're not so familiar with and it's all new to you and they're old maybe as well and, and you can kind of build easily build this image that they're some sort of special person um but you know for Kodo he doesn't you know he's saying he doesn't want you know he doesn't want you to look at him like this like you know just piss off basically like it's not about that at all um so yeah with these sort of words with these inspirational words um I think it's embarrassing, you know, just to see people just fall back on these things and, you know, just sort of cling on to these old words and just using them in a way that's kind of like, uh, you know, just creating an image. They're just sort of, you know, in the same way that I experienced these things when I was at the magazine, you know, it's a very superficial world. But, you know, it's in a way it's the same thing. It's like that quote uh, that was used before. Before It was like, uh, you know, in the same way that a geisha changes her kimono or something, you see a priest changing his robes or something so yeah it, this superficiality can can it appear anywhere basically and um yeah very often it can happen with just you know words um so i think essentially it's you know it's not about people's words and it's not up to them to inspire you um you know the answers need to come from yourself 
um, you need to create a sort of a fresh approach on your own. Um, I guess, you know, words perhaps can be helpful, but they can only really be a sort of footnote. I mean, you can't rely on them. Um, and another good example of, I guess, someone who, you know, wasn't trying too hard to be inspirational uh, was also Uchiyama. Um, and he also said, um, when I talk with young students, if I bring up technical terms or quotes from scriptures, they immediately yawn. If I ignore this and continue to talk in such a way, they won't come back. After all, Buddhist terms and scriptures are merely enumerations of jargon. Such language only talks about other people's thoughts using those people's expressions. The young students sensitively perceive that the vigorous life force of the speaker is not manifested in such talk. So I guess, you know, even you know, myself, I, I'm relying on, on Uchiyama's quotes and even the way that I guess I talk, like, you know, I still need these notes in a way uh, because for some reason I'm just not able to be, you know, confident enough to just, I don't know, just do it all on my own. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, we can fall back on words and we can rely on them too much. And um, I think particularly this idea of inspiration uh, can be a sort of, you know, sort of laziness. In a way. I mean, I guess for people when they're teenagers, they have pictures of all the people that they like and you know I guess when I was young there was people who I was interested in and thought were very cool and this sort of thing and you, know, you, get, you almost like rely on them for your own identity um, and you know say when these famous people die like say I don't know David Barry died recently and then maybe everyone suddenly feels like a part of them had died um, so yeah I think um, yeah, what I mean, what Uchiyama's like, you know, what I've just said here from Uchiyama is that, you know, you're you're if you rely on other people's expressions, you're you know you're you're not living your your own life. You're you're living through someone else, um, which is an illusion. It's impossible. How can you do this? Um, so if you're talking to people and you're using all these words, these old words, and you're sort of relying on them, and you're just sort of saying it in a sort of serene voice and this kind of thing, you know. People, uh, and he says, particularly here, you know, he's sort of promoting young people because he's like, young people can sense this because um, I guess, I don't know, I mean, I guess he taught some some, some young people and, and credited as well. And they've got this idea that, you know, that they've basically got a good uh, nose for, for bullshit. And if you have this sort of religious guy coming up and just sort of saying all these things, they can tell that, you know, you're just, uh, you're not a genuine person. Um... But yeah, I think to find your own answer is something that's not so easy um, because of the way that you are brought up. Um, you know, you have to be a baby, you have to be a child. And at this age, you are completely dependent on someone else, um, other people to show you how to live, uh, whether it's your parents or your teachers. And, um, you know, throughout this developmental stage you you rely on them to you know teach you not only you know things like i don't know basic things like how to eat or how to not sort of fall down a hole or something but then also how to moralize things or how to think um about other people how to treat other people and this sort of thing and i guess you know the culmination of all this uh, is is good and bad you're taught you know this is good you should do this or if you do something bad why are you doing that don't do that that's bad. Uh, you know, some people receive it in uh, different levels of uh, discipline, but yeah, you're taught about this a lot. And um, I guess, I mean, I don't know, just to really generalize things, um, I guess, you know, Western people have more of a sort of, I don't know, the parents, you know, wouldn't really touch them. They just sort of give them a it sort of rely on guilt of you, you did this did you so you know you don't really care about all the things I've done for you I don't know this sort of guilt tripping type uh, discipline whereas maybe some old-fashioned people would use actual sort of physical discipline um, but when I when I was um, a young boy I was like kind of I was like I wasn't like bad like oh he's like a demon child but I was like crazy like I used to just like 
do anything I wanted to do. Like if we went to some sort of thing where there was someone on the stage, I would just run on the stage and just be like appearing with the band or something dancing. I was like crazy. Uh, and I would get in so much trouble at my school. Like I, I was just, there was an age where I, I wasn't even like a group thing. I was just completely on my own. I would just like run off and then suddenly I'd appear like hanging from a window. There's one time I was just hanging from a first floor window and the teacher saw me and just like, what, you know, what on earth? Like, and then I'd be, I don't know, have to stand in a room for like two hours or something. So I don't know, for some reason I, I was this crazy kid and, uh, Luckily for everyone else except me, uh, my mum uh, was a professional you know, ass whooper. I mean, she was like really would sometimes, I mean, not, I mean, this isn't like a dark thing. She would just sometimes really just get me. And uh, there was one time I remember, I mean, I was sort of, my reaction was it, it wasn't like, I don't know, it didn't really sort of affect me so much. I would just sort of be get very good at lying and running away from her, but she'd always get me in the end and um, I remember there was one time where uh, my grandmother she she was always like very uh, a sort of calm woman and you know, she was a Christian and she'd always say oh god bless you god bless you and I, whenever my grandmother came I mean there was a period where I was sort of always you know fighting with my mum and I'd go to my dad oh god I hate my mum because you know sometimes she would Really, I, I mean, I'd do something bad and then I'd get a sort of clip around the arse or something. And yeah, it, it was like this sort of endless cycle. And then I'd, whenever my grandmother came, I'd always sort of, oh, you know, go to my grandmother. Oh, grandmother. Oh. I mean, in Chinese, it's popo. Oh, popo, so kind to me. She'd always come with presents. And uh, I was always just trying to avoid my mum. Um, and then one time my uh, grandmother, sometimes she would bring presents, like a big box of sweets and something, and then sometimes she'd send it. And then one day this big box arrived and I thought, oh great, uh, you know, some presents from my grandmother and I could see it's from Hong Kong. And then she, my mum opened the, uh, the package and it was full of bamboo canes, like a hundred pack of bamboo canes, <laughs> specifically for me and my sister. Oh God! It's like, how could you? You betrayed us. Uh, and yeah, and all of those uh, bamboos were used. And um, yeah, it was a terrible <laughs> present. Uh, it was awful. But, you know, even though I, I hated this as a kid, I, you know, because other kids as well, they, they would do things like, uh, you know, and, and even when they got older. I mean, my mum now is, I mean, I say all this now, but, you know, my mum really put up with me like I was a crazy kid. And I, I was literally, you know, a pain in the ass. And, uh you know, she 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 put up with me, and and now uh, she came from a very sort of strict um, Chinese upbringing, and you know she just wanted to raise me in the best way possible, and uh, yeah, I, I'm completely you know grateful for my mum for for the way she raised me, and, and and these days you know she's she's so open minded to whatever I do, and yeah, she was able to really sort of I don't know like think differently. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I was a crazy kid and needed some sort of discipline. But yeah, sometimes my friends, you know, they they would just get away with stuff. I just, what? You said what to your mum? I like tell their mum, swore at their mum or something. And their mum's just like, you know, a butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. And she'd, oh, like, you know, she'd make them another cake or something. Or I don't know. What? Uh, and even when I was a teenager, people were sort of, you know, drinking around their parents, smoking. And their parents let them drink and they're like, 14 what um so yeah i would always just have this uh sort of different experience of what was right and what was wrong um but in a way um i mean obviously i wouldn't like recommend this type of thing but you know sometimes words don't work and when you're a kid you know you can be very kids can be very manipulative and kids say some really crazy things like you know sometimes when you're a kid, I mean, you maybe don't remember what you talk about, but sometimes when you hear kids talking and they don't know you're talking, it's sort of what? like talking about really sort of like, I don't know, just stuff that if you were like a grown up, you would just, I don't know, people would, you'd be in like a newspaper or something like, uh, I don't know, being saying horrible things about women or I don't know. Sometimes kids will just say like really horrible things. So with words, you know, to kids, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I guess that's why people now rely on guilt because guilt maybe is like, I don't know, it gets in a bit deeper than, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Oh, yes, mum, yes, mum, uh, uh, whatever. And then you, you just do it anyway. But 
you know, if if you have guilt, I guess maybe it, you know, kind of, uh, maybe the kid starts to feel it a bit more. But yeah, I think um, you know, sometimes work you can't rely on words. Um, you know, you need actions, and obviously the action, you know, your parent, like, okay, that's a bit extreme, but um, yeah, somehow you need some sort of experience to uh, change how you think. Um, because, yeah, I think this good and bad thing, um, you know, it can become a very empty concept. I mean, you know, essentially, you know, Ko is saying, you know, forget it. Um, but, you know, somehow you still need to differentiate. And I guess especially when you're a kid, you need to decide, you know, what to do sometimes. And I guess, you know, that's why we have things like good and bad. Um, but, yeah, as Kodo says, um, you know, good and bad is something that's ambiguous. Do good, leave the bad. There's no doubt about that. But is it so clear what's good and bad? Good and bad go hand in hand. Um, so yeah, as he also kind of talks about in this chapter, you know, someone can be, uh, you know, a completely selfish person and uh, just an asshole. But on the surface, they might be able to, um, you know, appear like someone who's good. Technically, they're good. They tick the boxes. Um, I guess if you work in an office, you get all these sort of characters that just have this super cheesy grin and, you know, they're super good at, oh, like, sort of smoothing with everyone and got a good handshake and, oh, he's a good guy. I like this guy. But they're like, oh, God, this guy, asshole. Uh, you get all these people who just, you know, you can create this image of, of good very easily um, by their, you know, the definition of good, the sort of superficial definition. And you can have someone also, uh, I mean, I'd say superficially bad, but really there's some people who have, you know, kind of have done maybe some terrible things. Um, and yeah, I guess, you know, they are, they are a bad person, like maybe they've, you know, done something very horrible. But at the same time, that person can be, you know, probably the most honest person in the room. I mean, Kodo says something here, like, about knowing they're, you know, they're, they're the most humbled, humbled by their, you know, shame or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes you just, that happens sometimes, you meet people who, I mean, I didn't have a very, I mean, I talk about this thing with my mum, but I didn't have, like, a hard upbringing, I was, you know, didn't come from, you know, like, a sort of thing like Kodo had, um, but then sometimes, you you know, when I moved to London, you meet some people who, you know, had some crazy stuff happen to them, or they did some crazy stuff, like, maybe really hurt someone and then had to go to jail or something like this. And, you know, these people are, you know, kind of technically on society's terms, they're bad people, but sometimes they'll be saying things that, uh, you know, will really sort of blow you away. Like, uh, this guy is actually, you know, more honest than most people I've ever met. Um, and it's, you know, that's a complicated thing. Because if maybe I, you know, say, oh, mum, here's my new friend, he's been to prison or something, you know, how, how do you introduce someone like that? But then at the same time, he says things that are, you know, maybe a lot more honest than other people. Um, so yeah, as Kono says, only when body and mind have dropped off does this business um, not count anymore. So, you know, with words or with this uh, definition of what's good and bad, um, we need to somehow forget these sort of, the, the illusional side of this, this sort of superficial side and we need to really figure out for ourselves, um, you know, how we should think and act. Um, so that's the end of 26. Uh, does anyone have any questions for this part? Okay, then I'll continue to 27. Um, hold the date.